Welcome back to Two Homers and a Realist. This is the midweek pod before the Tennessee game. I'm Steve. I'm a homer. I'm joined by Connor, who's a homer, and Jay, who's Jay. a a Jay. I'm Jay. We don't have a realist little, little tonight. Jay Bird. Yeah, we don't have a realist tonight. Lucas is uh, he's in in route. He is coming back from Boston, traveling the globe, being the globe trotter that he is. The rest of us have just uh, eight to five jobs. We have to hold down the fort, but he's out there oh, gallivanting around. Nice. It must that, be nice. That, that quote unquote PTO. Yeah, th- this guy, he he just lives the life of Riley. You know, you know what's funny is he's missing this podcast. It, it's this podcast feels like it means a little bit more this week. It means more this week. You know why? SEC starts this week, oh, baby. That's what it is. SEC. That's what it is. It it's big time. It's the Tennessee game. This is exciting. This is um this is when it gets real. And I tell you another thing that gets real, and that's our sponsor, Dr. Keen. Dr. Keen, Michael Keen, he's a board certified surgeon specialized in orthopedic medicine. For over 20 years, Dr. Keen has been serving the greater Oklahoma City area along with Western Oklahoma. Not only does this include surgical skills and primarily the knees and shoulders, he is a constant figure on football sidelines throughout Oklahoma high schools and colleges. You know, he's got a deep commitment to sports and a devotion to his patients. He's kind of the kind of guy that it wouldn't surprise me if he got volunteer of the year. And, you know, he's the kind of volunteer I can get behind, not like these Tennessee fans. Yeah. And Dr. Keene, thank you very much for your your work and your sponsorship. So looking into where we are with uh, this game, we're seven and a half or seven point dogs. We haven't been this much of an underdog since like, the Blake years, 1998, never was Stoops this much of a dog. He was this much of a dog just in his his first year against Texas A&M at home, and he won that game. His second year, it was two-and-a-half-point dog to Nebraska. He was number one in the nation. We won that game. So you have to go way, way back to, like, 1978 to ever find a record where it's this bad um, before that. So, um, And we got it wrong. I mean, I, I mean, you call it. After the game the other night, Lucas called it. Lucas called it after the game the other night uh, on the post game that he think it was, thought it was going to be a. He got six and a half. Six and a half. So he's a point off of what it opened at on Monday, I think, or Sunday. Yeah. Um. So props to the realist on this one. Uh, he did something right this week. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a. Yes. I I want to say shocking, however, not that shocked just with public perception and everything else. So. Um, it's a big one this weekend. I'm pumped. It'll well, we'll get one. into that. That there's a lot to be said about what is out in the zeitgeist right now. The 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 feel is in the air nationally and especially among Tennessee fans. Where if you look at X, if you look at a lot of the social media, if you hear the national pundits, they don't seem to give Oklahoma a chance at all. And it it is to me kind of phenomenal how much they're just penciling this in as the Tennessee victory and maybe a big one. In fact, we this week have a special guest. We're going to chat with uh, we chatted earlier with Ryan Sylvia and from the ball report. So he is a beat writer um, through the Rivals Network and uh, UT grad. Um, that's Tennessee, not the other UT. He'd probably be quick to remind you. Um, he had a lot to share. We, we talked with him. So let's let's insert that right now. All right, we have Ryan Sylvia from Vol Report. Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. It's finally SEC football season, so it's fun. It's to talk SEC, about. baby. It That's just fun. means more. Um, so <laughs> I have to know right off the get go: Are you a homer or a realist? I guess I, I'd have to put myself in the realist category. Uh, I went to UT. <laughs> Everyone for, says that. Yeah, for just you know, for clarification, born in Knoxville, went to UT, but. Uh, you know, now now that I cover the team, I, I think I'd have to consider myself a realist, call it as it is, part of my job. So, so yeah, I'll, I'll lean to the realist side of things. Well, that makes sense. Tell us about your podcast. Tell us about the Ball Report. What do you guys try to do, and and what's your setup? Yeah, so uh, we're you know we're part of the media in Knoxville, so we'll we'll head to all the press conferences. We'll we'll go to all the games, follow the team, and, and do all of that. So after every press conference, we do kind of a mini pod, if you will, where you know kind of five to 15 minutes of just giving our thoughts about what Heupel or an assistant or what some players had to say. Uh, mm-hmm. And then games we'll, we'll do another kind of mini pod kind of quick reaction on the field where we'll talk about like, Hey, you know, this part looked good. This part looked bad. And just kind of an overall recap of how things went. And then 
twice a week. We also like to uh, hop, hop on a longer form podcast, kind of uh, recap the last week's game and preview the next week's game. So for like this week's situation, talk about Tennessee Kent State a little bit to start, but then obviously Tennessee Oklahoma is the big headline this week. So then transition quickly to that and talk mostly about that. And then uh, with the Rivals Network too, we're, we're afforded a lot of uh, other reporters from, from other schools. So we'll try to get in contact with, with someone over there and and get some thoughts from the other perspective as well. So podcasting is just a piece of a puzzle of what we do at Vol Report, though. It's it's mainly articles and written content as we cover the team, but then also we have a, a message board that's fun to use too. So I got to ask, is the message board as crazy as they is it, it is at OU? I don't know if you're familiar with OU's or everywhere else you go. Is it is it full of a bunch of crazies? Yeah, I mean, you have some <laughs> characters in there for sure. It, I think ours is is uh, it's pretty nice most of the time, but you know sometimes uh, you got some guys come out and, and they give their opinions and they're not afraid to call it like it is though, and that's kind of the the fun of it is is you yeah, for sure. diehard fans and they're they're not afraid to give their opinions. But uh, yeah, there there's multiple Tennessee message boards out there and. and Tennessee's fan base is rabid, but that's also kind of the beauty of of Knoxville in the Tennessee fan base. So, yeah, I, I mean, for sure, though, there's definitely some some entertainment value in it. Well, I would imagine so. And, you know, it's, as much as it's fun to poke fun at guys like us who are diehard fans and, and probably go off the rails and occasionally, we also keep the lights on. And we're the reason that podcast, uh, for, you know, at every different venue has has. Uh, is able to to maintain an audience it's because of guys like us who have too much invested in this thing way for much. sure <laughs> way too much invested. <laughs> so tell us your thoughts on tennessee obviously they've started the season really nicely three and oh just like the sooners but not just like the sooners tennessee's looking really good i would say they're maybe kind of the hot commodity around and some, somewhat of the talk of the nation especially with georgia fading last week what what do you guys think about tennessee in general so heading into the year, I was in the the nine and three boat, and and I think most people were between ten and two, nine and three. I, I was kind of the more pessimistic boat side of things, and, and going with nine and three. After the NC State game, I changed it to ten and two, and now I'm sitting here, and you're looking at how Oklahoma got off to a start, and you're looking at how Georgia got off to to that horrible start against Kentucky and kind of barely survived that one. And you, you still feel pretty decent because you get Alabama at home. And you start to look at the schedule. And I'm not going to sit here and say, yeah, this is a 12 and 0 team, but you start seeing a path to 12 and 0, to 11 and 1. And now 10 and 2 kind of feels like the floor for Tennessee. And, and I think we'll learn a lot this weekend against their best opponent yet against Oklahoma. Like NC State's a good team, but they're not a great team. And, and Tennessee was able to take that demanding lead and, and things kind of snowballed from there. So I think we get a much clearer picture of exactly what Tennessee is so far. But kind of my perspective on it and my expectations for the season have been kind of drastically raised just through three games, even though, I mean, the starters really haven't had to play more than a half yet. Yeah. And I mean, that's saying a lot too, I think, I mean, just taking a quick look at the schedule as well. Um, you roll into Norman, which I think a lot of people at least right now nationally are thinking that's a game you all should handle um, a public eye, public perspective. Um, like you said, that floor, I mean, you, you start looking at that path and just what Georgia did. Um, I mean, between Georgia and Bama, you guys can split those. I definitely see the the path is there for sure. If uh, 10 and 2 is absolutely the floor with, with 12 and 0 being a, a very strong possibility, depending on what happens this weekend. So, it, it, I mean, going into Athens is not going to be easy. I, I do think that's like no matter – how weak uh, Georgia looked and, and how kind of unimpressive that offense looked against Kentucky going into Athens, isn't going to be easy. And that's still probably a game Tennessee will lose, but also in the sec, if I think if you have 10 and two, you're in the playoff. Like if you're a 10, Oh yeah, no doubt about it. You really don't have any issue getting into that. day. You need to get to that's, that's the mark you need to get to. If you get to 10 and two, you're, you're all good. Obviously, you want to be one of those top four teams, which is going to mean you win the SEC championship. But even if you're not, I, I think you still have to feel pretty good if you're in that five to to what eight range and, and you get to host a playoff right. game. I mean, first of all, that's really fun to have a playoff game yeah. in your stadium. But but second of yeah. all, I mean, that's a really good spot to be in going into the playoffs. So Tennessee is now in a spot, too, where, hey, maybe you slip up a little bit this weekend and, and Oklahoma gets you. Season's not over uh, by any means. I mean, you're, you could still... Yeah 
have a lot of that season ahead of you and, and even lose another game and still be fine. So I do think that 12 team playoff has also maybe changed the perspective on, on a team like Tennessee this year as well. Yeah. I'm so I'm curious about your thoughts on this. Uh, the national media and pundits all feel like Tennessee's in a really good spot this weekend. Uh, you know, based off of social media, it seems like the Tennessee fans definitely feel like they're just going to roll into Norman, Oklahoma and, and drop 50 points on us and, and move on to next week's game. Does it worry you at all at the level of confidence from the Tennessee fans and most of the national pundits? Well, I think Tennessee fans would think they would go into a game against Tom Brady's Patriots and would roll them. So uh, <laughs> I'll too much into them. And once again, that, that's part of the beauty of Tennessee fans is the confidence. Good for them passion for them and, and that has so it's, all, all, so it's a whole group of homers yeah. <laughs> there's no realist fans yeah. is what you're talking about. Well, I, I mean, if you go back to to those kind of dark eras i mean even when the last time tennessee played oklahoma in those butch jones type butch of jones teams, yeah jeremy pruitt right after that things obviously did not go well in those three years so there was a period of time where where there wasn't a lot of hype but but what hypel's done has kind of brought everything back to like a a big confidence level for this fan base but this team's pretty veteran led. Like they've got a lot of guys that have been there for the entire hype, entire Heupel era. And even a lot of the younger guys are guys that Heupel's kind of handpicked and kind of fit the mold of what the culture he's trying to build in Knoxville is. So all of the outside noise, I don't think that's really going to get to the team. And I don't think that'll be a big factor in the game. If they lose, I don't think it'll be because they went into it thinking that they were going to roll Oklahoma they have a lot of respect for this team. Uh, obviously, that's coach talk to a, a respect when you're in a. Can you hear us, Ryan? Yes. Okay. All right. There you go. Sorry, and we'll, we'll just trim all this in post, so it won't, yeah. be a, it won't be a big deal at all. I think yeah. we got the gist of what you were saying as well around Tennessee not just rolling in. So. Um, yeah. So, um, tell us your thoughts on the Sooners. What do you know about Oklahoma? Um, do you, have you, have you had a chance to kind of brush up on it and do you have any serious takes good, bad, or indifferent? We just want to hear what your honest take is. Yeah. I, I try to, you know, take a look at, at every team Tennessee is going to play. And, and that, that obviously includes Oklahoma with it being the first SEC game, especially. And it's a team to me that you can tell there's a lot more out there for them. Like you can tell there's a level of play that they haven't played to that they're capable of. And from what I've seen as kind of an outside perspective is a lot of it revolves around the offensive line. And I know there's a lot of injuries and it looks like from that injury report, things are kind of looking good uh, in terms of some of those guys coming back for, for this weekend. But that has been kind of my biggest focus is all right, what's that offensive line going to look like? Because if they're struggling in some regard to a Tulane, to a Houston, then what's going to happen when one of the better offensive lines in the entire country in Tennessee comes to town? Like that could be the difference in the game to me. So that that's kind of where my vision has been focused on the most. I, I know there's also been some injuries at receiver. Uh, Jaleel Farouk uh, is a guy that, I mean, his cousin, Adris Farouk is a freshman on Tennessee. So I think yeah. that was probably a game that only had circled on the calendar. And unfortunately, Jaleel is going to be held out of that one. So uh and then Nick Anderson obviously hasn't been able to go yet, but I think that could be a difference maker as well against the Tennessee secondary that's pretty young and inexperienced. So for me, the main focus has been the offensive line and then just kind of in general injuries. But in terms of Jackson Arnold as well, he, he kind of fits that mold of what I talked about with the entire team where he, I don't think he's been bad, but I think there's another level and maybe a level after that that he can reach that we haven't necessarily seen yet. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, injury report, and that's something as OU fans, we're not used to at all. Um, Big 12 didn't require any sort of publication of injuries. It's always you hear who may or may not be playing on Tuesday press in the Tuesday press conference, and then you wonder all week, and then it gets to game day, and they're either out there or they're not. So this injury report is something that I've personally been looking forward to just because of the amount of guys that we've had out, to, like like you mentioned, on the offensive line and the wide receivers. So um, wanted to ask you a little bit about Tennessee, just taking a look at the injury report on your, on their side. Um, I see Jordan Thomas as DB, John Slaughter at DB, and uh, Shimarad um Umarov, I believe, on the off on the offensive line, um, all listed as out. Are any of those major losses on the Tennessee side of things, or are those more role players that are just listed because they have to be? 
So this is actually new for the SEC too this year. So so we're still oh, okay. To, All right. This is the first time on the Tennessee side of things we, we've had to or been kind of able to look at this injury report. It's much nicer than kind of. I mean, even the first three weeks, you're sitting there, you're getting there three hours before the game, you get the binoculars out, and you're like, all right. Yeah, exactly. Without warming up and trying to <laughs> piece it together because Heupel is going to give you nothing during the week about it. But in terms of those three guys that are out, uh, John Slaughter doesn't really play much. He, he's still a really young guy. And then Umarov as well, a, a young offensive lineman. So those two guys I don't think would have saw the field against Oklahoma anyway unless there was mm -hmm. further injuries. Jordan Thomas is he would have been the starting nickelback for Tennessee, but he suffered a season ending injury uh, in fall camp. So he uh, will be out for the whole year. And, and gotcha, gotcha. that's a okay. tough loss. And it's one that they're still trying to kind of figure out what they want to do there. They have two guys that kind of split snaps between Christian Harrison and then a true freshman in Boo Carter. But that one is not a surprise for anyone. The biggest name on that entire list, though, because even the probable guys probably won't play uh, against Oklahoma. Lance Hurd is the starting left tackle for Tennessee, though. Yeah. He's a former five-star uh, sophomore that just transferred in from LSU, and he looked really good in the first two games. Uh, missed Kent State. We all kind of marked it up, too. Well, it's Kent State. You don't want to – the guy's a little banged up. Give him some rest. But questionable is an interesting status for Lance Hurd and definitely one to, to look at going forward because, I'm, like I said, that's your starting left tackle, so that could be a big loss. Yeah, that's someone we were interested in as well because he was thinking about – Coming to OU as a, as a transfer this year too, so that's one that we swung and missed on, unfortunately. So, so just to, um, for some of your fans that are going to be listening, uh, I think it sounds like maybe a little bit of sour grapes. Our injury report, and I know you touched on it. Really, our O line has truly been decimated. Mm -hmm. uh, Bates is technically our fourth string center that's been playing the last three games because. Hickman, who was a transfer, he got hurt on the second drive of the opening game. And our left guard moved to center, and he tore his biceps. And our starter from last year for the last several games got hurt in the preseason. So, really, Bates has been fourth, and it's caused a shuffle all across the offensive line. Mm -hmm. And we really haven't figured out a good grouping yet. So, for us as fans – the potential of Hickman playing center and Everett moving to guard could possibly solidify at least a serviceable line, a serviceable <laughs> offensive line, right? Because what we've been dealing with is, is honestly for what we're used to is absolutely putrid. <laughs> like we're just all beside ourselves. I can't imagine what Jackson Arnold feels like having yeah. to, to go through it or the running backs. Um, and then, Again, as as far as the wide receivers go, Gibson was a potential starter we lost before the season. Farouk, as you mentioned, broke his foot. And then Nick Anderson's been injured. Nick Anderson hasn't played this year yet. Anthony. Angel Anthony hasn't he played like two snaps this year. He's he's recovering from an ACNL, ACL. So there was a point during the Houston game where if you if you consider Dion Burks our number one wide receiver. Our our sixth and seventh guy also got banged up. So our, we had our first and our eighth and ninth string wide receivers playing at Houston. I mean, to have five or six wide receivers out, again, for someone like Jackson Arnold or even the offensive coordinator Seth Luttrell in a, in a banged up offensive line, for us fans, we're excited just to see a couple of these guys back because as you touched on it, we've left a lot to be desired on, on what we're accustomed to and what we're capable of. What I personally am hoping for is just a serviceable line that provides a little, little bit of time for Jackson Arnold. And again, and, and keep this a game for that. Yeah, yeah. Just to keep this, honestly, keep us in the game. Cause you're correct. If we don't, if we don't have some of these guys back, I'll be I'll be the realist here. <laughs> I don't think we have much of a chance. Yeah. Um not against that defense. No, we yeah. don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, we won't keep you much longer, but we, we did want your thoughts on a couple of things if you're comfortable or have an opinion. So we like to do a couple segments. One is we like to make locks of the week. And I don't know if you had any locks of the week that you wanted to throw out. Um, I know it's off the cuff. We didn't give you any chance to prepare. But it, do you have any uh uh teams for this upcoming weekend that you think are just a lock to cover the spread? 
And yeah, I just pulled up ESPN to see if there there's anything that quickly jumps out. I usually go, I, I will admit, I, I usually do throw uh, not a lot of money, but a little bit around on the weekend. But <laughs> not uh -huh. week. I do think that Tennessee does cover against Oklahoma this week. I think okay. they're looking at about six and a half, seven right now. I think right. Tennessee by a touchdown because of, of that discrepancy on the line uh, with how good Tennessee's defensive line is. And, and even if Oklahoma does get back, some guys, I, I, there still is that kind of accumulation period of coming back mm -hmm. three that we'll have to see how things go there. Um, let's see, scrolling through to see if anything jumps out. Um, trying to find the the total total lock that that uh, you know you feel really got to be one out there that just jumps off the page to you. I will, I will say, uh, after watching Kent State last week against Tennessee, forty nine. Uh -huh. I still kind of feel like Penn State covers. And, and Penn State <laughs> looked pretty bad against a Bowling. lot of points. Penn State looked pretty good at bad against Bowling Green in week two, but that Penn State yeah. team is worse than I think a lot of FCS schools. So that's that's mm -hmm. one that I see that kind of jumps out. Um, I'll take Fair Virginia enough. to cover three and a half against Rutgers. Uh, okay. I really like Kyron Jones. I think he's a really nice uh, quarterback that they have over there. Even though obviously they got off to a, a pretty rough start against. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, built to, to open things up and then you know what I'll, I'll i'll do it too i don't know if this is going out of a, on a limb at all but i'll take florida state to get their first win in cover three. Oh wow oh, all right I'll take taking them with the win outright huh okay they, they <laughs> not necessarily up. covering the spread what's the spread in that game florida two? state's favored by two and a half in that one yeah on and so I'll, okay. I'll take them to to win by a field goal even even though there is okay no reason watching their football that i should think that it's it's a sad situation down in Tallahassee, that's for sure. <laughs> and well, one last uh, question, unless the guys have anything else to cover. Do you have a score prediction for this Saturday in the uh, OU Tennessee game? You've already taken Tennessee as a probable lock. So um, what's your specific score prediction? So I actually just wrote it down today and, and I am going to go lopsided on this. Uh, I okay. think it's 41 to six Tennessee. But I, know, I know that that's a, a big difference. I just yeah. think this defense is that good. And I think this will be a coming out party for the defense. I think it'll be James Pierce Jr.'s game where not uh -huh. that he's bad, but maybe he starts to put the stats together instead of just kind of the quarterback hurries. And then I think Nico plays at a good level. I, I don't know if this is like, oh, here's his Heisman moment. He throws for 400 yards. Because I don't think that's necessarily the case because Oklahoma does have a good defense. But I think he plays at a good enough level that he protects the ball. Tennessee's able to get the run game going with Dylan Sampson in their offensive line. And by the end of the game, things start to snowball and maybe it's a misleading score. Like I don't think Tennessee's going to jump out to a 21, nothing lead in the first quarter or anything, but right. I do think that this one starts to swing in Tennessee's favor. Well, I could see if that played out that way, I think that'd be a combination of our offense, probably giving some points to the Tennessee defense and then the, the OU defense really just getting worn out and getting to a point where they just can't yeah, stay on the field much, anymore. Yeah. And, um, I think and when you're when you're doing that against a great offense, you're in trouble. I think part of that could be field position battle too. Like if, yeah. even if it's not a, a pick six to the house, you get a turnover and you're in positive territory, you're going to probably right. hold at least three. Or even if you force a punt deep in your own territory, Squirrel White takes it inside the 50, there's maybe three, maybe seven. So I think that could – play into it too but it to me it is an Oklahoma team that I feel like they're just kind of getting I feel like if this is a game that's played later in the year I think it could go a lot differently I think it's mm. kind of unfortunate for Oklahoma the timing of it with all the injuries and, and trying to kind of get things going for Jackson Arnold because a lot of the pieces aren't there around him so I do think it's one of those situations though that kind of the time that this game's played like we've seen with Tennessee and Florida in the past where Tennessee always mm -hmm. gets early and it feels like Tennessee is the better team by the end of the season than Florida is, but Florida starts better. And then you look at the the result and Florida wins most of those games. I feel like it's also kind of a situation. Right. Well. All right. I can, I can really see that. that I can not say how badly I hope you're wrong, but I, <laughs> I also think it's an ex extremely fair prediction. Um, yeah. I think it, it's funny. I mean, I, I think if you went around and took a, you know, a poll of OU fans, I think you'd probably find more right now that tend to lean towards lopsided Tennessee than confidence in OU. Um, so I definitely don't think it's crazy. I just am, uh, I, I'm hopeful it's, it's, <laughs> I'm hopeful it's crazy. So we'll see, but. I don't so think maybe there's some small stats that 
are interesting to some to you and some of your fans. This is only the third time, right, that we are a home underdog. Well, we haven't been a home underdog this much since 1998. Yeah. Um, and the only time we've been this badly a home underdog, but it, it was back to 1978 at 78. least. I think the stats only go back that far. Um, so it's it is a rarity that yeah. we are ever this much of a dog at home. Um, and you know, that goes back through the years when the Big 12 was extremely dominant, when in the Big Eight, Nebraska was very good, uh, Colorado was very good for many years, et cetera. So and this is really saying something as a seven, as, you know, call it seven point dog at this point. So we'll see. Um, it, it'll, it'll potentially give us a lot of reason to be fired up, but it may not be enough. Being fired up may not be enough to overcome uh, just to, if there's a big gap. And, and I will say this, uh, I have tendency winning by a lot, but I am by no means like it is a 100% lock. They win this football game. There, there is a role. Right. There is a possibility that Tennessee loses this game. I, I think that, I, like, obviously, I think that Tennessee is going to win because of my score prediction and because I think mm -hmm. that both are going to cover that spread. Yeah. But there, there is absolutely a chance that Oklahoma can take down Tennessee this week. It's not in one of those situations where, yeah, I don't see that as a possibility. I do see that as a possibility of happening. I just think it'll go the other way. Yeah, yeah I think it's a game That's with fair. a lot of volatility. Like yeah. you are really predicting with your score and what you're saying there that things can swing wildly and look very different at the end of the game on the margin. Yeah. But it could have been a different game the way it transpired, and it could be a very different game just as it goes um, in terms of who actually wins and loses. So it'll be interesting to watch. Well, we appreciate you taking some time to be on the pod. Yeah, thanks yeah, thank um, you so much. Really Jason. appreciate it. And stay, um, stay in touch too. Let us know when you get out to uh, get down to Norman. Hope yeah, have it'd be, a good, time it'd be good to ho hook up and and buy you a beer or or just uh, show you around a little bit if you got a chance. So that'd be a lot of fun. But we hope you have a great trip to Norman. Be yeah. safe coming in and going out and. Have a good time. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'll be in touch, guys. Thanks for having me on. I All really right. Am. Yeah, take care, Ryan. Thanks. And so that was that was Ryan's take. So that was interesting. He had some he had some interesting um, viewpoints. Uh, what do you, what stood out to you guys and what Ryan had to share? Uh, first of all, thank you, Ryan, for coming on. Uh, really appreciate that. I think it's good to get some some outside perspective, uh, especially from a, a direct opponent. Um, I said it. I said it on the, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, the the interview or the conversation. Um, that score is just it's staggering to me. I, I was left a little bit speechless hearing it. Um, and we'll get into our score predictions later. Uh, to see how those shake out. But, um, like I said, I really hope he's wrong. Um, I think he's going to be wrong at least to an extent. Uh. He did preface with uh, with it being a lopsided a lopsided game, so I guess he's got that in sort of a a hedging situation. Um, if Tennessee is good enough to put forty one up on this team without us scoring a presumably not scoring a touchdown, I, I assume he he means two field goals with the score of six. Um, I mean that's a we're talking Tennessee being a, a runaway national contender, right? I mean, they're outperforming most teams in the nation at that point. So um, regardless, some good insight. Uh, again, really appreciate Ryan coming on. Uh, excited to, to possibly see him in Norman this weekend. Hope he gets a, a good experience first time down. So, um, yeah, overall, a, a good insight. Yeah, the same. I mean, there's a tiny, tiny little fraction of me, really tiny, that – would be really interested to see what it would be like around here if we did lose 41 to 6. In his defense, I, I think it's more likely we lose 41 to 6 than we win 41 to 6. Oh, yeah, I, I agree with that. Right. Um, Narrowly, but yes. There's yeah. so we're, we're talking about things literal, that are literal at the real, real tail end events, very unlikely events. So maybe that tail's a little fatter on the one side than the other, but yeah. man. And I, that's a, that's an outlier. I didn't press too hard, and and I was going to throw this in there, but we were kind of wrapping it up. Um, I feel like Tennessee fans and whoever else are not really evaluating their first three opponents and are looking at our three opponents as if they're on the same scale, and they're really not. Now, have we performed up to our standards or what the team feels like? Absolutely not. But – 
we also haven't played some juggernaut, but they've played literally nobody whatsoever. Yep. And nobody can sit here and say NC State and Houston are different because they're not. Well, outside, 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 outside of the national better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for, for Houston's better statistically yes. significantly better yeah. than yeah. them. Tulane is, so is true is far above anything that they've touched. Houston is above NC State, I think. And then you, you look at Kent State and Tennessee Chattanooga, those two teams, I mean, arguably aren't as good as Temple. And well, they're not according to yeah. ESPN. FBI. And maybe by a gap. And we think Tulane beats Houston and NC State, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Tulane yeah. would be favored tomorrow against NC State. Oh, yeah, definitely. So so, so they haven't faced a test. We faced again, a we're test. Not, we haven't Tulane. played, again, we haven't played great teams, but at least we've played serviceable, serviceable Division One, With good skill players. From a, a Power Four conference, Big 12 out of Houston, and a really good Tulane team who people are talking about one of the potentials of being that at-large bid for the playoffs. So – well, at least we're a little bit more game tested than they are. So, yeah. so Nico is going to go from, you know, Chattanooga to Danny Stuffman and Billy Bowman, and apparently just going to just wax the floor. We're, well, we'll find out. Um, and then also on the skill position side, their defense has not been tested by anybody like we've been tested no. with ten, with Tulane. Tulane's skill positions were actually really good. Some have argued. What What did you say, Jay? Maybe better than anybody will face all year. Yeah, there's a chance collectively it's it's one of the top skill units, as you mentioned, that we'll see all season long. Yeah. I mean, Mario Williams was a five-star wide receiver. And has put up big numbers already. He's averaging put 25 up, yards a catch. Put up huge numbers against coming into this State, game. And what, we held him to three catches for 50-plus yards? Yeah, and contained catches, And contained too. catches. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's it's funny. We, we get off a conversation like that, and I think, I think my knee-jerk reaction is – immediate confidence mm -hmm. say like no that's not going to happen and you know let's let's rally the troops this is bullets and board material and um there's but no doubt that. there's no doubt in my mind though that i mean there's been a lot of stuff come out this week um yeah i hope it's the nick saban rap boys oh there's and but and there's no doubt on the other side of it that brent venables has been using that to motivate as well i mean if bill Bedenbow isn't in there saying telling his offensive line like nobody thinks you guys are anything like right. nobody thinks you can do anything against this Tennessee defensive line. If that's not any sort of motivation, I'm not saying motivation gets you to where you need to go, but it does something. It, 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 it'll get you aligned with paying attention, focus, getting focused, getting your attention doing your job. throughout the week so that you're doing your job, learning your job, and it'll get you game ready also come game time. And so when when the lights go on and it's ready to go, I imagine that OU will have a different mindset than Tennessee potentially has in terms of when they take the field, hit that line of scrimmage, and are ready to do battle. And we you, may hit them in the mouth and they get shocked. I don't think we're going to get a hit in the mouth and be shocked. And you can't discount what, whether you want to call it hope or enthusiasm for getting some of your guys back. Right. right. Our teams survived, if you want to call it that. The first three games of the season before we start this SEC schedule, and knowing we got through it, and a lot of guys got a lot of reps that probably wouldn't have played all season long. Right. And now we're getting some guys back. That's also going to be an additional. That's a good point. Confidence. Boost. Well, it's not it's just a confidence it's booster. Valuable. It's a talent booster. It's a literal booster. It's a huge yeah. booster. I mean, you're getting the guys that you want to go into battle with, and you're getting and you're getting guys back that you need back, but you're getting those guys who are not going to feel see the field as much when their name is called upon it's not going to be fresh they're going to be seasoned to a point right within these first three games to well, say significantly more than they were going yeah to. i've been under the lights now i've been in real game situations i know what my coaches expect of me i know the pace that we're trying to run on the field you're not throwing them into the fire if you need them um whereas in the past we've had guys come in and not be ready in those situations so mm -hmm. You can spin all this into a positive way. It's going to be, I mean, I've said it multiple times tonight. It's going to be a ruckus Saturday night. Like it's, I, it, I, I can't wait to feel what it's like inside that stadium because I don't think we will have felt a game, or at least an opening portion of a game like that, in pushing a decade. 
Ohio yeah, State. Like Ohio State was really kind of spoiled yeah. because of the rain delay. Everybody goes under, comes back. Kind of a really weird transition. Um, we have bad luck in those games too. Yeah, we do. Well, that's I I, I I've uh, hypothesized that that is why we are not striping the stadium this week. It's <laughs> for bad luck. We had bad <laughs> luck in big games when we striped the stadium. Lost in Notre Dame. Lost to Ohio State. Well, I find that to be a mistake. Um, but I find it to be a big, big, big mistake. Um, I think it'd be better to have everything aligned enthusiastically but it will be a, a a very electric atmosphere i have no doubt about it. if you look at the ticket prices out there and i know there'll be a lot of orange and white fans from tennessee but it's going to be the the real true ou fan showing up and this might be their opportunity to show up now and if we can be competitive much less win then it sets momentum for the rest of the season. If you are if you aren't able to do that, you're going to have to recover as a football team, or the next games aren't going to be as meaningful. They won't mean as much. Uh, by the time you're rolling around to Alabama, it could be a totally different season. That's for sure, one way or the other. But if you win on Saturday, oh my goodness, does this set you up in a different trajectory? Well, and that's actually something Ryan brought up pretty pointedly, and I I like to take on it, and it's not something that I've really thought about this week it's been so focused on just the game and feeling like this is all that there is you go when you're in, you're competitive in this game and you lose it's not the end of our season right it's not the end of the playoff hopes it's not the end of anything everything can yeah it's a blow be in it's front a of you. blow to the confidence that you probably have and um makes you question the trajectory a little bit more but overall if you go and you put together a good performance and you simply get beat well, you've got to steal a game that we all might have thought preseason was a game we might lose or count it as a loss potentially, right? Because we right. counted this one as we should win at home versus Tennessee, right? Right. Prior to the injuries and everything else. But now you've got to steal one, whether it's a Missouri or a LSU Ole or Ole Miss. I don't know if LSU will be a steal at this point, to tell you the truth. Yeah, maybe not. But you still got to – it's still maybe different than what most people thought. Right. Pre-season. No, absolutely. So you've got to take one somewhere now, else. Now, that's a good perspective, though. Think about that. I think what we've seen is, from the preseason perspective to now, the Tennessee and LSU games have really flip-flopped. And it's a it, it's where Tennessee looks a lot more challenging, and LSU does not look as challenging. And Missouri, South Carolina could, could be more evened out as well. That's a good point. That's a very good point. So I think you've got to be 9-3. and three, with OU scheduled to get into the playoffs, I actually think the respect we're getting rightfully with our schedule will get us into the playoff most likely at nine and three, 10 and two. It's an absolute lock. Well, we've the got playoff. what four teams in the top 10 right now? Five it's, of the top seven. Five of the top seven? Yeah. That's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It like, is, of course, they I, won't all stay there. No, but, but it's, I mean, that's probably but only because they'll self eliminate, right? It's probably unheard of. Oh, I think. Oh, so. I don't think, I mean, I couldn't tell you. Anyone that's ever had five of the top seven teams. And it can already be presumed. I mean, Texas will be number one as we go into that game. They're They're number one right now. They they, they don't play anybody until us. So we'll get to play the number one, which is going to be awesome. I can't wait. But that's just – it's unreal. As a football fan, you have to hope that every team gets injuries throughout the season. And maybe we just just got all of ours done out front. And it could hurt us for the Tennessee game. But then we just we just keep getting better and better and better and better and better and better, and better, and other teams start losing players. It is it is truly possible. It is not even that unlikely. Um, now hit me in the head with a hammer. I'm going to try to be a realist for a minute. We have difficulties on offense. We have difficulties on the offensive line in particular. We know we're facing what is at least on paper an extremely good defensive line from Tennessee. So. As a coaching staff, this is a challenge. I think you've got to look at it a couple different ways. Now, you do get a good practice squad to go up against to understand your actual strengths and where you are. You still don't know game speed, what it's going to look like when the clock starts. It could go one of two ways. Let's assume you've got at least one of the guys back from injury, maybe two, either way. You start out doing the things you want to do with those guys in the position and everyone else subsequently in the position you want them to be in. If it works, okay, it's easy. That That's what we wanted, and we're rolling, and we're doing good, and we're competitive. If it's not working, that's where it becomes challenging. And Seth Luttrell and 
Bill Biedenboe and, and the entire unit has to figure out what they do, what the option B is for when it doesn't work and what, what gimmicky things, whatever, have you got in the arsenal that you can go to to be serviceable to give yourself a chance in this game? Well, you need to see it fast. Exactly. Right? Like – you can't figure out in the third quarter what second you do. possession. Yeah, it's gonna be two drives. Right? Two, two drives. drives. If you're not able to do what you think you should be able to do, you've got to completely change. And even if you have to shorten the game, the field the field, roll Jackson out, run pass option, and just try to go back to the well as many times as it'll work on a few things, you do it. You just do whatever you can do. One thing that'll be interesting to see is if they transition, at least at that point, if not throughout the entire game, to a real clock management. We're going to try and milk the clock shorten it. and shorten the game. I don't even know if that's a terrible idea. If you are doing regardless, it, yeah, regardless, it's with the defense that we've got, it might be if the way you to can go. Figure out. I mean, if you are in a position where you're up in the third quarter, I'm not saying get conservative, but you need to have something drawn up to where you extend drives and milk the clock. Yeah. Like it, you you have to. Against this team who can go put up points like we saw, I mean, again, against much, much lesser opponents, but who can seemingly score pretty quickly, you can't – if you're in a position to go win a game and you're not milking the clock, yeah. you're not doing it right. Either way, if you're up by 7 or 10 or, blessed be, 14, or if you're down by 3 or even 7 in the third quarter, you've got to look at it as, well, strategically – Let's try to shorten this and so they don't expand on their lead. Right? Well, let's let's but one, you want to be competitive. You don't want to have lost really bad. You take the the conservative L. And I'm not saying you play to lose by a little, but you play to lose by a little or win by a little in that position if you're down slightly late yeah. in the game. Yep. And you start to look at the clock and think, all right, we can shorten this to be we get three possessions, you get two if things go right and we can be winning it on our last possession, or maybe we're giving the ball back to you where you're going to have to go score to win this football game. You can't be looking at it in the third quarter in that position of, well, we're just going to keep going and see what happens. And let's see it. Let's see if we can get a two minute drive and hope they don't. That's not probably going to be very productive. It's going to have to be a lot more tactical. For sure. Very tactical. Yeah. And, and that'll think, be, it'll stress the coaching. Staff. And it's going to be, it's, you know, you actually, you go back to a game like, like Texas last year, where right. I feel like we could have been more tactical, had a chance to put that game out of reach and, and we do did. it. And however, and, and Texas actually worked it tactically very well. Right. Scoring late, leaving just a little time, and we happen to go down and score and win mm -hmm. the game. But you need to treat the game very, very strategically where you're counting possessions starting in the third quarter. Yeah. Like you, you have to start counting and considering that because you can, you can have something in your hands and you can, we've seen it before. We've had these wins at our fingertips. We don't manage a possession well, or we don't manage a drive well. And all of, all of a sudden things turn on a dime and they're up because we gave them an extra possession. Right. So with a lot of time on with the a clock. lot of time on the clock and, yeah. and then it leaves us with and we, you put the you put the ball back in their court where they're driving down to milk the clock and kicking a field goal to win the game. You got to think about it from the standpoint. Also, if we get into the position of we're on defense and we're either up narrowly or we're down, how aggressive do you want to be because of the clock? And so in the late in the fourth quarter, if we're in a position like that, as always, I'm going to be very critical if we're not playing aggressively enough. There could be a, a chance that we actually want to sit back and make them earn something. But it, at some point, you're like, well, OK, here's the deal. We're going to go for broke. And if you score, you score. But we're going to have enough time to have a shot at this thing. And if you we're not going to let you move down the field very methodically, milk the clock down to where we have no chance after your last second field goal to either ice it or to take the lead. So that'll be something that I'll be looking for. Hopefully not. Hopefully we're winning comfortably, but that just doesn't seem very I just want to I, I want to just be able to control the game to an extent. Like there's gonna have to be a level of tempo dictation with us to be able to not let Tennessee just completely grab it on both sides of the ball. Yeah. Because there's gonna be some swings. I really think there's gonna be some swings in this game where it's like, man, 
but one way or another, it's it's that team had the momentum, but this happens and the other team's got it going the other way. And you've got to be able to really, really manage that to be able to go for 60 minutes and come out on top. Well, let me get back to home base, which is was homerism. And to be honest, I think this is a realist take potentially. There's a chance we come into this game, we we win the toss, we kick to them, and our defense just takes them off the field three and out. We go down and get a field goal, and we're up 3 nothing. Our defense comes down and shuts them down again. And then we're looking at a real realistic possibility of winning this game and maybe looking really good doing it. Um, the tide turns in your favor in that position. Can we hold it? Can we hold serve? Can we complete a game and, and, and have an entire game that's like that? That'll be a real test to see if we can actually do it. But I wouldn't be that surprised if we don't come out and look astonishingly better than what we think we're going to look, both offensively and defensively. I also won't be surprised if we're just inept and this is going to be a real long year. I could see that too. But we've got a lot of talent, and that talent is getting healthy on offense. We've got a lot of talent on defense that can surprise a team like this. I'm not going to make a prediction that it's going to be something outlandish like it was, but this has the type of atmosphere that a uh, un, except for the fact we don't have the offense that a game like the jump around game had where it was supposed to be a battle of two equals and it wasn't or like the Iowa State game was way back when in, in 2000 yeah. uh, uh, in two, two, 2004 four. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or three I, I don't um, it's got you know the, a lot of different types of games where we surprise people again it's not going to go like this but it could be like the game was it 2001 against Texas A&M, and it was 77 to nothing. 2003. 2003, yeah. yeah. Um, and so where you're just surprising someone who's coming in thinking that they're a lot better than they are. Again, I'm not predicting that. I'm predicting something that's going to be a very big dogfight all the way down. But we could, we can surprise to the upside in a way they can't surprise to the for sure. upside. Yeah. For sure. And, I mean, I, you go into that and you think, I mean, game day's here. I don't think we. I don't know if we've mentioned that yet. Game day's here. Um, I'm expecting a unanimous unanimous pick for Tennessee across mm-hmm. the board, across all. You know, because they just picked to win, not to cover the spread. Except for the guest they picker. just, yeah, they except for the guest Have we found out who that is yet? No. Um, I so, want Patty Gasso. Oh, I'd be I, good. Trey, I think that'd be the best. Trey Young would be good. He'd be my. But I would like to see be really the good. two Nick Sabans next to each other. The Nick Saban of that football and the Nick Saban of I like uh, softball. Um, but I think you can expect that outside of the guest picker. Um, that said, I mean, Steve, exactly to your point with how you kind of open this game up, I, I do hope we can defer the kickoff. I hope we get to – defense should set the, set the tone for the game. And I think we have the talent to do that. I think you could – hit Tennessee in the mouth right off the bat and be like, Hey, you're not going to do to us what you've done to these other guys. We're not that team. We're not those defenses. Um, I think we have a real opportunity very early on to show that our, our strength is going to match your strength. Mm -hmm. And then we'll see what happens on the other side. It really is a strength versus strength on, on OU's defense versus Tennessee's offense. And I think these games typically are actually determined on the other side of the ball, the ball. When you've got guy, you know, their defense is good. Our offense can be good. There's talent on both sides. That actually might be, at the end of the day, what determines the outcome, mm-hmm. where the other thing is just basically a draw and holding serve. And if you're holding serve and you're talking about your defense is the one holding serve, that puts you in a position to win if your offense can just go down and score. For sure. Um, I don't want to get too nostalgic, but to wax nostalgic for a minute, I wasn't at the Tennessee game in 2015. You both were. Lucas was. You guys talk very fondly of it. But, Jay, walk us through a little bit about both what that meant, what it was like with Baker Mayfield, where we stood coming into that and and where we emerged after, and maybe talk about where that is positioned relative to Jackson Arnold. Yeah, going into that fourth quarter of that game, Baker Mayfield had really not played well at all. I mean, the entire offense had not played well. Defense had kept it bad. It, it felt and, like Houston. And not just that game. It felt game, like the Houston game. Right, that season. Right, we uh, had, he played well against yeah, but not. He played well against Yeah, Akron. but not. 
It's not what Baker became, right? No, even after that game, what Baker became. I agree. Uh, I agree. But up to that point, I mean, all the fans around us and all the people texting, we were almost unanimous, including myself. That Trevor Knight need to get on that field. Put in Trevor Knight. We're down Put seventeen to three Knight. at that point. Yeah, I'll never forget turning to Shelby and and the dude that I ended up embracing at the end of the game, just saying, "I'm why is Trevor Knight not in the game?" And yep. like, like, very, like, and it wasn't I mean, even that's how bad. It, it was, that's what's we crazy. It wasn't a crazy question because we looked so bad. Yeah, like we looked, and we looked like the offense that we saw against Houston. Yes, truly. And and that was a Lincoln Riley offense that yep. was just a net. And then what happened? Well, history speaks for itself. We come back that fourth quarter, we win in overtime. Double overtime, right? The legend grows yeah. from there. Was it I double mean, overtime? It just took oh. off. It was double overtime. It was. Never yeah. forget. That was one of the so Shelby still talks, my wife still talks fondly. She she didn't go to the jump around game. But she will hold firm in that that was the best, most fun game that she's ever been to. Oh, I agree. I can only imagine. And, I agree. And it was unbelievable. I mean, Ohio State we, was great, but it doesn't hold a candle to that game. I'll give um, no, not even close. I don't think so. Yeah. I, it's I where was actually very underwhelmed for an Ohio entire State. new. It was a complete new era. It's a, a new era. Yeah. So if we, I'll give Tennessee fans credit for this. If our stadium, and fans, and music, and decibel level, et cetera. If it can be 90% of that game, it will be off the charts because I'll that cry. game I'll cry. was unbelievable. No, it unbelievable. And that's what's funny. Is see, were... You've been to hundreds of more games than I have, and I'm telling you right now, that is pretty much, you know, at least modern era people, that game is by far the loudest, hardest. When we were sitting at the, we were sitting at the top of the stadium. I cannot imagine Being what the noise level, right? what the noise level was yeah. on the field. Yeah, like I, the, and tip yeah. noise goes up, but yeah. Oh, okay, that's fair. <laughs> but no, um, that that's just, some, and that is a testimony not. to their fans, and something you have to praise because Tennessee football had been in the wilderness for a long time at that point, and really wasn't. They were thinking that was their emergence out of. No, it, it was, and every talk radio show that I was listening to on the way to the game, because mm-hmm. I was all local Tennessee radio stations, said the exact same thing. This is it. This is Tennessee's coming out party. Butch Jones has it figured out. This is where we emerge mm-hmm. as the Tennessee of old, and to go and do what we did was, oh. Well, incredible. I remember when I was very young, and we actually I've walked on the field at Tennessee, and it was on a vacation. We stopped just to see different stadiums, and we went to Tennessee among others. And I walked on the checkerboard and and everything. It was so funny. It was different back then, back in the day. You, you could just you get out and get up. Yeah, yeah. I, there was a groundskeeper, and he just kind of said, "Oh yeah, come on over." And it, you know, it it, it was just really cool to walk. I remember thinking why don't they make the checkerboard go all the way to the end line but i understood that they needed to have some gaps so you could see who was in bounds and out of bounds uh so it it was it was really hollowed ground and i was a student even then as a, at a young age of the history of college football and i knew i was walking on hollowed ground of a storied program and that was really at the tail end of that this is the 90s and it had been a long time since the general and they they had really faded Phil Fulmer came in. They obviously won a national championship. They had great years under Peyton Manning, did not win with Peyton Manning. But then, you know, let him go inexplicably, I would say, and um, just faded for a long time and almost went through as bad a spell as we went through in the 90s. Uh, And that was a pivotal point in 2015 for both programs. We actually emerged the victor and actually went further along, and, and they stayed sort of moving sideways a bit and now they're with hypo it's as interesting as that is with the, the story and how that folds back into ou that they now have a chance to re-emerge as a, a top 10 type of program that's it's really nice to see i like seeing a team like tennessee re-emerge and be good i just don't want them to be that good this saturday we yeah no. yeah we'll see well, let's transition into some predictions. Let's talk about some things. And um, first of all, before we get into those, do you have some trivia for us, Jay? I do. 
Yeah, snuck up on me there, Steve. Be, Be prepared, prepared, little boy scout. Be more prepared. All right. As we mentioned, game day's here, right? Huge, big deal. Nighttime game, primetime TV, ABC. So, my trivia to you is what was OU's first televised game and who did they play? First televised? I would say the first televised game, I'm going to guess, was 1939 against Tennessee, where they got beat 17 to nothing. I don't even have a guess. No guess at all? I concur with Steve. All right. Incorrect. I'm just guessing because of, of that, and sure. I don't even remember it's 39. So, November 8th, 1952. Okay. Wow. Against Notre Dame. Wow. Very good trivia question. I wouldn't have had any idea either. So, Connor, if, if fact I check me on that, that it was 1939 that our first ball game was against Tennessee. Um <laughs> Uh, it. I'm gonna look it up and see if I can verify that. Um, we got beat zero to seventeen. I'm pretty certain about that. Um, 1939. It was our first bowl game in the Orange Bowl. It is a legendary game for just how absolutely brutal it was. There were multiple fights. There were arrests. I think there literally were arrests because of the fights that broke out. It was. It was a rough time. It was very different. So I thought that's what you were going for, but. 52 yeah to imagine we went through an entire year of winning the national championship and not being televised that entire time can you imagine can you imagine being a fan who went to the games and then to go back and talk to people who didn't go to the games and they just listen on the radio and you're explaining it what to I that how about that the life i want to live wow it's been tough the life to be, we do live yeah true it'd been tough to be a podcaster back then that had been a whole different yep. yeah 52 <laughs> against Notre Dame. And what was the score? Um, we lost. I can tell you that much. 27-21. Yep. Oh. Yep. That's a that's a good that's a good trivia question. Very good. Well, let's let's get into some predict predictions. And that of course starts with the locks of the week. The realest deal. Locks of the week. So the locks of the week. Um Let's start with our listener. We have loyal listener Josh, our good friend Josh. He um, supplied us with three locks. And actually, I should bring up, I should have already had this. My apologies. Again, be prepared, little boy scout, uh, with what our record is because we get to brag about our record, boys. That's right. We, as a group, are doing really good. Three of the four of us are doing really good. <laughs> so last week we were nine and three. Um, I, unfortunately, was one and two. Connor was two and one. Lucas and Jay were three and zero. Oh. The listener was one and two. So so far for the season as a group, we're making money with 20 and 16, 56 percent. The listeners five and four, also 54 hmm. percent. So let's see if we can not just uh, match but exceed the listener this this week. We'll see if we can beat Josh. So Josh has some interesting ones. I I tell you what, I think he he did some good research because I like these picks. He's got Florida giving six against Mississippi State. He's got Minnesota getting two and a half against the, the mighty Iowa Hawkeyes. And then he's got a real sleeper here, Bowling Green, getting 23 points against the Texas A&M Fight Nagies. Uh, that, on that Bowling Green performance against Penn State, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. so that game is at Kyle Field. Um, sounds I, like I am, fix to me. I am interested in the outcome there that's going to be interesting well let me give you mine then we'll roll into you guys and, and we'll get we got lucas's from remote i've got kansas state giving six and a half to byu i've got michigan getting six against usc i think that i don't think a lot of michigan i flat out do not think michigan's very good i think that usc is also a bit overrated and they're rolling into the big house that's going to be a challenging game hope you're for right them. hope you're right and then I've got a little team called Oklahoma. They're getting seven and a half against Tennessee. I like it. And I I did find on FanDuel seven and a half points. And so uh, I'm sorry, Ryan from Ball Report. Um, 
your lock uh, in based on your score it's is busted. not a lock. It's busted. busted. Sooner's going to cover. They might even win the game outright. What do you got, Connor? All right, to lead us off, I've got Miami, Florida, giving 16 and a half against South Florida. Uh, next, I have Kansas State giving seven, seven and a half. Six and a half. Six and a half. That's right. New lines out. Sorry, I hadn't adjusted that on mine. Kansas State giving six and a half against BYU. Same as me. And lastly, I have Oklahoma getting seven and a half against against Tennessee. Tennessee. And it's, like you it's said, free money. I might just pick them outright. It's free money. We will see. There's going to be a money line. The money line's got to be generous. On Ryan, that. your your lock is busted. Ryan, we're busting the lock. We're breaking through. I'm gonna put this I'm gonna, is it. I'm gonna put my mortgage on this one, guys. This is this is that's a lock, baby. I like it. I yeah. like it. Hey, if I you're not gonna go me. big, if you're not gonna go big, don't go at all. Jay, why don't you go? We'll let's take the guy down five. here for last. I've got five I'm choosing from <laughs> Whoa. It's three. But I wanna hear what's Lucas got. All right, Lucas. <laughs> you don't want to pick different than Lucas. Lucas has Nebraska giving seven and a half to Illinois. Good pick. I, I think that's a good pick too. Um, Colorado giving one and a half to Baylor. That's kind of a, a, a contrary sort of a reversal pick. I it's hard for me to pick. Col- I, I'm so on the the bandwagon of Colorado's done. It's hard for me to I do think, it. But I Baylor's think, bad. I think a random may be able to draw some stuff up defensively. I don't know if it'll be enough. I don't know anything about Baylor. I, I didn't know anything about Baylor when they were in our conference. I don't know anything about them now. Well, what's interesting is, now I don't know under Aranda exactly if this is true, but you're looking at thugs versus thugs historically there. TBT. Uh, so we'll see what happens. And then finally, he's got Boston College giving six and a half to Michigan State. Okay. Okay. I kind of like that one. All right. Just so we don't have a few of the same. Um, Pick what you feel. Man, I've just I've Pick got your confidence. Did I'm you have trying. one? Did you I have, have one that was a, one of the same as us or different than that? Or, or the opposite? I have the same game but different. On pick one. it. No, 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 it. I don't go with your heart. Great. All right. I'm going to go with this will be interesting. I'm gonna take Texas. Oh minus 44 and a half. That's a lot of points. I guess you are out of points. Here's why. I don't know that. UL Monroe scores, and I think they are going to want to pump the stats with Archman. So is he a confirmed is, starter? Yeah, is he going to start? I'm almost positive he's starting. Really? I haven't seen that, but I would be shocked if he's on. I heard it wasn't a big injury, though, to Ewers. I yeah, but you don't bring it. him back. You don't bring back Ewers for UL Monroe. You just don't. True. So True. I, I think they're just going to they're just gonna want to blow that up as much as they can. Fair. Um. This line has moved up and down, back and forth, side to side. Oklahoma I, State? I don't, yes. Yep. Last I looked 15 minutes ago, Utah was now plus two on ESPN. I showed it. To They're home. back to plus They're two. Back to yes. plus They're two. back to plus two. It is unbelievable how that – it has literally yes. flipped between basically two and a half to two both sides. Now, the only thing that worries me, and because we're potting, I couldn't check this. Did they announce that, like, Cam, Cam Rising's Cam Rising out or something? I didn't see anything. That's my only concern with that. Is It has flipped in the last four hours. Yeah. Because it was the other way. Yeah. But I'll I'll take Utah plus two all day long. Utah plus two against Oklahoma State. That's actually up to two and a half now. Two and a yeah. half in the last 20 minutes? It's yeah. up a half a point? We're yeah. giving it to Somebody you. had to – someone had to get – Cam Rising has to not play. I don't know. That's, that's wild. That's wild. They don't release injury reports in the. But that's little moving 12. really fast. Well, it, it it's moved twice points, back and forth. Two that's, points in a couple of hours is, is a huge amount of money. Well, and and it's moved that way. It's only yes. Wednesday. College football report reported two days ago that Cam Rising will play against Oklahoma State this weekend. Oh, it know. opened within the favor. It flipped to them to be the dog. It went back to them being favored, it's, and now it's now it's actually the dog. it's blowing up. Like, is this line move just telling me Cam Rising has a real chance to be out on Saturday, or is there some actual information out there now that all of a sudden 
people are losing their mind because of this. Is it two versions of smart money and they've yeah, that's crazy. Opinions? Oh well, that'd be fun either way. Well, it'd be right? it'd be fun if you were playing it both ways and you could middle the bet because you, you could, could middle you the could hell out it. of this bet because they never shift that much. No, yeah, and not twice. You could have got both. Teams. You'll never see one move. You could have got both teams for two and a half points. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> Everyone thinks it's because Cam's not playing. Oh wow. man, okay. that worries me. There seems to be some inside inside. Well, hedge it. I'm going to recommend that you hedge it. If we get to Friday or Saturday morning and it's clear what's going to happen, you, you know what? To I still like two other games. I'm just going to drop Utah. I'm dropping. it. You're dropping it. I'm dropping. It. Don't drop this it. This is unprecedented. Oklahoma State can lose. Don't worry. Wait, I don't like it. I don't like. Yeah, it. he wants to do it. He wants like to drop it. it. You hey. know that. You know what that means. Utah is going to win by, oh, three by thirty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go Arkansas minus three at Auburn. I like that. I do like that. And. I do too. And then this next one. God, is, Arkansas can break your heart, though. I, yeah, I saw this line, and I, I was very unsure because I think they're a good football team. And I think they've proved they're a good team. Tulane minus three at Louisiana Lafayette. I don't know Rangers. why you're I don't know why you're on the fence on that line. Like that that seems like a way up pick to me. Well, I, I'm on the fence because because of exactly what you said. So I'm gonna text someone and have them parlay. Because Vegas because just that's doesn't crazy, that's doesn't do parlay that. with what? The Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, picks. Utah, <laughs> and yeah, and the Oklahoma State game. Five legs. I mean, they up. they put up a good fight against us, a really really good fight against Kansas State. Yeah, and they're just going to go only be a three point favorite against the Raging. Cage. I'm assuming they're away in that game. They are, but it's still their home state. No, it's still ULM. It, I mean, it doesn't not, make it doesn't sense. make sense. Not going or to sorry, uh, Lafayette. So I don't know, but there we go. Well, I. Yeah, I, I'm kind of mystified by that. There's some weird lines right now. Um, the Oklahoma State one's fun. It's, 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 that's a lot fun. of fun. Yeah, that's, that is, that is a, it's an incredible swing. It's It it could it's only be a quarterback. It could only be Cam Rising. There's it nobody else. Nothing right. else There's, it could be. Or Ollie Gordon they, got arrested again. And they so all, I, they, I don't think Ollie Gordon's that material. Well, and, the, and Cam Rising is that material. Yeah. yeah. That's on the other side. Like, Cam Rising is that off. Is, is there a more disappointing player right now in college football than Ollie Gordon? No. Besides all of Oklahoma's offense. <laughs> I mean, I mean he, none of those guys were not, nobody were touted. On, were yeah. touted. And nobody on offense for Oklahoma except for Arnold as a long shot was a Heisman candidate. And don't get me wrong. It, Oklahoma State's giving him the ball, right? Like he's yeah, carrying, he's carrying the ball. Well, they did. Well, when he's not whining ball. about it, and he's and he's injured, he's injured. He got I think injured. He had again. like five carries in the first half against Arkansas, for because, not a lot of yards. Because you can just overthink everything too much as college coach. Has he broken a hundred yards this season yet? I don't think. I don't close. think so. If if I mean, if anything, it would be with his receiving yards. He's had a couple of good total receiving, yards? yeah, oh. total yards, but I don't think so. It's been I, I don't know. Interesting. Um. Well, that's good that's a good um, segue into our prop bet of the week because our prop bet of the week, courtesy Jay, is will we have a a running back? Will any OU running back, one or more, go for more than fifty nine yards? You said sixty yards, so I'm going to say more than yeah. fifty nine yards. Yes. So we got Connors and over. Hard, I'm a, hard yes. I'm a, going to break out. The running game is going to look completely different this week. I'm very excited. About I'm an over. What do you What do you say, Jay? Um, I'm gonna swing under because we're still playing with butchers. Lucas is under as well, and I definitely get the under pick. I understand what's happening there, and I because, purposely didn't put rushing yards because right. I do think Arnold it will be over sixty. Right. Myself. Right. Yeah, I could see that for sure. And I understand with our struggles and what you've seen statistically, but think about it this way. It takes one breakaway run, one just stupid run, a run that shouldn't happen, and a guy could get 60-plus, or he could get 40, 40, and then he gets one more run or two more runs, and he gets there. So it's one of those that's really interesting. You could be with the under. You you have to wait till the very end of the game. I mean, you could have a situation where you're trying to salt it away and it's a backdoor cover because Tatum breaks free for a 70-yard run out of nowhere when we haven't run the ball for more than 30 yards at any you know point in the game. So it's, an, it's a very good prop bet. I think it's very apropos with the difficulty we've had running the football. 
and what's probably a need. I mean, if we, it's one of those metrics they always look at that it tends to be the case, and they always put it on the board, how many yards did you run for? They know that most of the time when you run for a certain number of yards, you win the game. Your yeah, probability yeah. of winning is higher. It's correlated with winning. Um, and if we can't run the ball, that's scary. That's really scary. Uh, and if it's just Jackson Arnold. And I hope I running, win this part, right? Where Sacho has 58 yards. <laughs> Barnes has 58 yards. Tatum has 58 yards. And, and Jackson, Jackson Arnold has 150. 150. <laughs> <laughs> I would take that. Yeah. I would definitely take that. Absolutely. Well, let's get into score predictions. So, obviously, Ryan, uh, our guest, has had his say with 6 to oh, 41. Um, oh, Brian. Let's run through the group and let's start with Lucas, who's remote. He's traveling. He's in the air right now, traveling. Lucky. What? I mean, he's lucky he's in the he's air. He's getting there, shipping, sipping champagne. Enjoying first class the way he does, um, probably yucking it up with some Hollywood movie starlet. You know, the guy, he has a final score in the game, OU 20, Tennessee 34. The son of a bitch thinks we're going to basically be double. They're going to double up on the line. I just, there's no realism in that, if you ask me. Burn, Lucas. Yeah. Don't I hope crash. I Don't hope crash. I hope he chokes on that champagne. Choke you on the champagne what? in front of the hot yeah. Hollywood movie star. Yeah. Make a fool of yourself. Exactly. I don't appreciate it. What do you got, Connor? I have Oklahoma 34. Tennessee 31. 31. I thought you had 21. 31. 31. I, uh, Three point victory. Okay. I think it is. A very and again, thirty-one points is it looks like a lot of points on the board. I think against this team, I think our defense has a really good game, and kind of like what we talked about earlier, I think it's going to come down to late game management. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we have to kick a field goal to win the game. I'm not predicting that drama, but I do think we are going to have to figure out how to get a couple of stops and go and close out a game on the offensive side of the ball. And uh, narrow margin of victory, but a victory nonetheless. Jay, what do you got? OU 31, Tennessee 30. Nice, nice. I think I I started off, just to be completely honest with you, even after playing better against Tulane, just not feeling like we can win this game. Um, the uber amount of confidence from their fan base on social media and even national pundits. I mean, I guess it's changed my mood. What is Paul Feinbaum saying? What is fight pick? I, I don't what know. What are those guys saying? I just. Yeah, what did Paul Feinbaum say in the. I haven't uh, listened to him. I haven't either. But just, he was on He was on Scoops, right? He was on Scoops. Oh, was he? Uh, yeah, he was on Scoops. Uh, just to be honest with you, cast. most of the time when it's that lopsided, they're wrong. The majority is wrong. It seems when it's this crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tennessee fans, they really do. They, I, mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's not Tennessee fans out there picking at 60 to nothing. I mean, that, that's how stupid they sound right now on Twitter and social media. There's and, some and, arrogance coming through for sure in, in some fans. And it's kind of the arrogance we've seen on the OU side in other years when we've been riding high mm -hmm. and then we get slapped by reality. This feels like a lot of Texas teams to me. Yeah. Right. There's just oh, he's not been playing that great. Oh, Texas played so good so far, and their fans are just buying up all the tickets they can, and dumb OU fans are selling their tickets because <laughs> they think we can't win anything at all. And it's just we come out and smack them right in the face. Right. Could happen. I think that's how this game feels. Um, you did pick the most narrow margin of victory possible. Yeah, I know. I think it's gonna be a tight game. We haven't shown that we can do anything other than that. Now, That's fair. the other part of my optimism, and, and it's small optimism, is getting to see this report. Because I, I honestly hadn't settled on a score until I saw our injury report. Yeah, we haven't talked about that. Let's uh, let's get to Steve Pick first, and let's get into yeah. the injury report. Let's do, because... That injury report is going to show how that's cute. Both of you guys have really nice, cute picks, but you're wrong. We're not going to go to overtime. Both of you rely on us getting to overtime. 
<laughs> and I, I that would I told, actually no. To be serious, I think that that those scores make a lot more sense if you look at an overtime situation where do. it could be a defensive battle, and all of a sudden you get some points to to elevate it. We're not going to. We're going to win twenty four to twenty. The Sooners are going to actually be ahead comfortably. We're going to have a narrow, kind of scary. They score late. With we hold them to a field goal and they try an onside kick. We recover and the crowd goes wild. It's going to be fantastic. Twenty four to twenty, the Sooners are victorious. I like the low score. That it is low. Like a, uh... That's maybe the lowest score I've picked for an OU game. Yeah, that's pretty in low. a long time. Probably really. ever on the spot. A long time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the injury report. Yeah. Um, so again, we, we talked a little, little bit about it with Ryan and something new for all of us this year. I guess I didn't realize until he mentioned it, that it's new for everybody in the SEC. So this is new in the SEC in general. Um, but kind of like I mentioned on, on that conversation, we're used to getting a very <laughs> high level if any update in the Tuesday press conference from Brent. Cryptic. Um, speculation uh along the lines of anybody who's seen practice that week and who's been practicing or who's who's been in pads and suited out it's to the point that i'm surprised when they do the starting lineup and they announce it on the big jumbo or yeah. whatever that they don't say or or <laughs> right and and even to the point where we've seen <clears throat> for example danny stutzman last year in bedlam uh fully suited up goes through full warm up doesn't play a snap so Dylan Gabriel um, against Texas. Dylan Gabriel against Texas. All of this kind of you Nick know, Anderson this past weekend in Tulane. <laughs> yeah. Smoke and mirrors stuff that we've been dealing with. And there'll still be some of that with the injury report. I mean, they're gonna divulge and not divulge as much as they can. But um, real quick on some of the key guys on the OU side of the ball. Um, you have some of the obvious guys who are out, Gibson Farouk. Uh it is it is worth mentioning Gentry is still out. Um, Hatchet on the offensive line is listed out. Hey, yeah, tours pack. He's, yeah, he's, done. he's done. done. Uh, San Nicola, who some thought might have a chance this week, is listed as doubtful. Cade McIntyre, uh, our third string tight end, listed as questionable. Branson Hickman started off the year at center. Um, probably our starting center at this point. Right. Listed as questionable. Um, that would be a big one to get back. So we'll monitor that over the next couple of days. Um, so with this injury report, you're required to update it Thursday and Friday as well. Um, Jake Taylor, not sure what happened to him, but he's listed as questionable. Nick Anderson, big one, probable. Andre Anthony, big one, probable. Kendall Dolby, don't even know what happened to him during the Houston game. I think it might have been touch. Or before the Houston game. Yeah, or, or yeah, or something that happened. Uh probable. Oh yeah, before the before the two lane game. Yeah. yeah. And big one to note here, who we've been waiting on, who we've been hoping for. Troy Everett. Probable. So Jay, you mentioned it before the pod. You've you've made a couple of good points tonight. Um, if there's a way that we can find Troy Everett and Branson Hickman on the field on Saturday. It completely changes the makeup of the offensive line that we've seen thus far. Not to mention who's, you know, teams have been able to bracket uh, Deion Burks up to this point. And right. the young kids have to tried their best to Had their raise separation and, and make plays. But, you know, they're not a Nick Anderson. They're or not Andrew. an Andre Anthony. So, I mean, it, it could be massive for our offense. And really quite the shell shock for a Tennessee team that's probably looked at tape that's like... Exactly. Yeah. It, it, especially from the standpoint of if you're a young defensive back, you're a player, it's hard to appreciate what you don't know. And we we talk about this because we're so intimately and knowledgeable those, about the OU team. And those guys put Brendan Thompson back doing what he does. Right. In right? the slot, yeah. And that just puts him hitting go balls. Right. So if you're a, a, a defensive back for Tennessee, it's one thing for you to say, for as a coach, to say, hey, you need to look out for this receiver. He's really good. You don't have any tape on that guy except from last year. It's not going to be something you prepare for in the same way. You're going to be focused on Seth Luttrell. It's 
I mean, it sets up for a situation that potentially could be so advantageous for OU by happenstance. Not not like you design it, but it could still work out really nicely. And that is if you've got a new offensive coordinator, and so you're going to focus on that offensive coordinator's tape, you're not going to look back at prior years that much, and you don't have a lot of tape on the guys who might be actually on the field. And those guys that might actually be on the field are the more talented players in many different positions. It's going to be hard for them to reconcile and understand what they're up against and take seriously what they're up against. So it, it, it may be something that really just shocks them in terms of our ability to stretch the field vertically. It doesn't have to work out that way, especially if the offensive line can't hold, but it certainly has that potential. I mean, these are players that Jackson got thousands of reps with, right? All through the summer, all through the fall. And just not just from a talent standpoint or their previous production, but where to go, how quickly to get to that spot. Is he going to catch it? Uh, blocking on the perimeter, right? How many right. – we haven't really dived into this too far, but how many run plays could have gone further this year than they did if you had a Nick Anderson blocking for you? If you had uh, a Dion Burks who's not the focus, like right. is how many one-on-ones with linebackers does he get? How many one-on-ones with safeties does he get? now right right well Versus, that's what i i hope i hope this unlocks dion to a massive extent because like you said focus does have to shift if it's not going to unlock dion it's going to unlock, unlock someone else but i want to see dion burks running down the freaking field getting behind his safety and us hitting him on a long ball actually what i think you might see is a dion burks coming across a deep middle that's wide open and we just eat their lunch on that where we've stretched the field and everything else is working both in the intermediate and the deep, at least to distract and pull those defenders away. And that opens up the middle of the field where he can do his work, where we know he's lethal. And I do think there's a chance we've played a little bit of possum. Oh, I don't think there's any doubt. Because there's no reason. The line has protected a lot of times well enough to throw something down the field. And we really haven't hardly thrown any passes down the field. Well, and we know, and, and we there's know, no reason not to. Brandon we Thompson, know Jackson can do it. Yes. Well, not just that, but Brandon Thompson can run past every single Tulane, Houston, and Temple defender there is. And yet we didn't do it. We and we haven't done. It. So, I, there, there. I mean, I sure hope so. I yeah. sure hope it's a it's a thing of possible, which I I truly believe that it is. I think there's reason to believe that it, there is, that that at least is the game plan. It doesn't have to work, but that can be the game plan. Now, the game plan can blow up, and they can have a great defensive performance, and you never get to try to do the thing you're trying to do. But I would imagine that is exactly what they're going to try to but do. But we haven't even done it just to scare people. No. Right? You don't even have to complete it, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just do it just to do it. But I think this is the game where you do it just to do it. You don't do it just to do it against Temple or even Houston, because we know that talent's there, and especially if that talent is returning from injury. If you can do it in this game, and even if it's an incompletion, that's got to get the attention of the defense, and I they've got the to first... react to it, and then that opens up so many other things. I wouldn't even hate the first offensive play of the game, where it's a yeah. play-action, bootleg, go route. Arnold throw it 70, right, and show them that, one, you've got the arm, Two, you guys can't catch Brandon Thompson. Maybe right. It's not completed. Maybe maybe it is, but it's there. It's there. Yeah. So you've Be got a whole line of this. And and at that point, you've got two deep safeties. You've got a, an entirely different scheme, potentially, that you're going up yeah. again. But then then it's back to your court to say, okay, now it's there. Can you run the football? Now it's there. Can you throw the swing pass? Can you make sharp hit him over the middle and and bleed them for eight yards and really get them on their heels. I'm predicting first play wide receiver screen to the Burks. I hope it's not a um, uh, jet sweep. Jet sweep. I hope it's not a jet sweep. No, I'm thinking it's going to be a Burks screen pass right side of the field behind two wide Now, what if it's a fake jet sweep where you're hitting Brendan Thompson deep on a post route? I'll say – 
I'll Let me say, because I think Tennessee likes to play very aggressive and very downhill. I'm going to say it is a RPO, unfortunately, with two tight ends. I think our first thing is like a 28-yard pop pass to – Sharp over the middle. 28 yards. I like it. I, I like it, and I like the sharp I like idea. I think the backers, the backers are going to go because we're going to want to, yep. quote, establish the run. Right. And we're going to pop it over pop. there. We're in plus territory. Right there. Well, it really, it really could be if you look at the – you know, we had that for a touchdown, and we had that for a must-have first down against Tulane. It's, it's the kind of deceptive thing, and – It's not a first play of the game call. Is what I like. Right. Yeah, it's very... They're going to they're gonna look for that, for sure. Right. But not the first place. Yeah, I think you're right. Because nah. you know who we did that to also? Georgia. Yes, we that's right. Two in a row. That's right. To Dimitri Files. Well, I, I, I love the play, and I love the strategy in general, that you're looking at it from the standpoint of where are my strengths, where are my weaknesses, how do I avoid those weaknesses? And it's quick. And it's quick. It gets it out of play very quickly you don't want to start where you're laying down for a seven yard sack um you don't want to be in a position where you have to make decisions but you want to you want to get their their offense or the defense off balance very quickly if you can just start the game with a field goal in a game like this that's a very big advantage to start the game I, again if you can either get the ball first and get a field goal or you can get the ball second you've stopped them and you get down and you're up 3-0 and giving the ball back to them that's what this football is all about that it it's not the old days and it's not against a, a rinky dink type of opponent where you're saying where well, we're going to score a or we're going to score b it's just going to matter of, of which one no we're going to have to figure out how exactly we're going to go down the field it's going to take strategy this is going to be a real game where we test our medal, it's going to test Seth Luttrell. It's going to test our defense. It's going to be a fun game. It's really it's going to be fun. a very interesting I'm game. Excited. I'm very excited. Well, anything else to cover before we sign off? We've covered a lot of territory. We're going to come back. We're going to be full post game. It's going to be a late game. So it's going to be a late pod. That's going to be fun. We're going to be celebrating a victory, hopefully. Um, at the very least, hopefully celebrating the fact that we played really well. It'd be nice to get the victory, obviously. I hate moral victories, but there's a chance that you have a moral victory and you look really good doing it, and you're still in the hunt for everything. It's not like the old days where one loss like this really sets you behind and in a way that you need so much help. The season's in front of us one way or another as long as we look competitive. Go perform well. We just have to perform well. And if we perform well enough, we're going to win the game. Until then, Boomer, Sooner. Sooner.